Nothing's gonna happen yet, relax. Press is satisfied. Are we all right now? Yeah. Of the Greater London Council, virtually the sort of deputy mayor of the place. Now, the last 10 days have been very, very stimulating for two reasons. One is that uh, I do believe, in spite of the cynicism of some of the mandarins of the civil service and uh, others, that we are, have uh, begun the renaissance here of thinking. The fact that uh, hundreds and hundreds of people queue up at lunchtime to hear our two speakers is a good thing, and I think that uh, politicians of the world ought to take note as to what has been happening here in Vancouver. And I think the cynics who have been present the well-fed and well-paid cynics will uh, pack up their tents and disappear, and they will write all the knocking copy they like. But what's been happening here... <laughs> what's been happening here is that there has been a tremendous uh, marriage of idealism and practicality. And to that end, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce you to a gentleman I've only got to know in the last week, Mr. Laquien, who is the Associate Director of Social Services and Human Resources Division of the International Development Research Center uh, funding institution in Ottawa, Canada. He is a Filipino citizen and his current research interests are rural urban migration and problems created by it. And then he will say one or two things and then we will hear Margaret. It has been a marvelous uh, audience. What we're going to do is work through till about quarter past three. If the oh, opportunity three arises, three o'clock, Margaret reminds me with her usual gentle way. Uh, <laughs> if we can get anything in before then, we will. But now I think we ought to start and hear what they have to say. Well, Dr. LeQueen, can you just get up now and do your bit? That's this one, I think. Isn't it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm told I have to be brief. Uh, the appetizer in every main course uh, should really be pungent, but relatively small scale. <laughs> the best way of introducing the topic of the human settlement, the human element in settlement planning, is to call our attention, I think, to the attractive logo of this conference, designed by the talented Canadian artist Frank Mayers. The habitat logo which Frank has designed says it all, and more eloquently, I think, than all the torrents of words that have gushed forth since the beginning of this conference. The essence of habitat, as you can see in the logo, is mankind, in the midst of his abode, within the context of his universe. This is not an egoistic view of man, not an anthropomorphic view of the world, not even a male chauvinist view. It is, I think, a humanist view most appropriate for habitat because it states simply but most forcefully that in this age of industrial dehumanization and urban alienation, there is a need to make sure that humanity should be the center and the essence of settlement development. How can this view and this vision be achieved in our planning of human settlements? First, by reintroducing the human scale in the planning of all our physical and social structures. Second, by seeing man in the context of his relationship with his, by the intrusion of the physical man-made environment that engulfs him. By some historical process, our view of the nature of man has shifted somehow from a belief that he is a social animal in groups to a conviction that he has a lone individual who rides alone into the sunset. 
Even our perception of man's burdens has changed. The tribal elders who laid down the rules and made sure that they were followed have been replaced by the psychiatrist who probes into a man's neurosis and psyche. There is a need in the discussions here at Habitat to bring out these social aspects of this human element. I have been told that somewhere in New York, there exists a community where single men living alone, single women living alone, families with only one parent, old folks living alone, or young people living together now constitute a majority of the households. The family as a unit, with mom and dad and brother and sis, has somehow quietly slipped away in this community. Far from seeing this phenomenon as a banner of personal liberation, it saddens me. It wrenches me inside also when I walk the parks of great cities in North America and see the old people whose existence has been reduced to the comfort of a park bench. The need to share reflected in feeding wary squirrels and conversation finally reduced to clucking and cooing with pigeons. Once on a planning mission to Calcutta, a World Bank expert asked the chief planner of that city, what provisions do you have in your plans for senior citizens? To his surprise, the chief planner of Calcutta said, I'm sorry, sir, we do not have any plans for senior citizens because, and here he smiled, you see, in Calcutta, we do not have senior citizens. We have grandmothers and grandfathers. <laughs> the discovery of community in social science, I think, is a very recent phenomenon. Man in his primary group community has to be rediscovered. At the Vancouver Art Gallery at present, there is an exhibition of the results of an international competition for the planning of a low-income community focused on my dear city, the city of Manila. First prize in this competition was won by a 35-year-old architect from New Zealand who has never been outside of his own city. The main feature of the design which won him the prize is that instead of designing a house or a, for a poor slum dweller, he has laid out the premises wherein a community of men can work and play and eat and sleep, compete and cooperate and quarrel and love. In the modern cities of the world, there is a call to popular participation, community involvement, citizen action, and other aspects of a grassroots movement. Happily, for most cities in developing countries, there is little need for expensive bureaucratic structures that are ironically charged with the main task of getting people to participate in the performance of jobs that the bureaucrats themselves are supposed to be doing. I think it is a sad commentary on our state of affairs when the simple task of sweeping our front yards, mending our fences, and even the very simple chore of getting the garbage out has to be done by government paid functionaries. All these tasks and many more are cooperatively carried out by people in primary group communities all over the world. In the slum and squatter community where homes are built by self-help, there is no need to exhort people to participate. They are already participating. They are already doing things together, solving their common problems, raising common resources, sharing the costs and the benefits of their common efforts. I think it is one of the tragedies of Mr. Chairperson, Mr. Introducer Person, men and women and others. If I want to test this to see if you can hear in the back of the room. Can you hear in the back of the room? Can you hear? Yes. Put your hands up at the back if you can hear, all right? Good, all right. spend it. And in the middle? <laughs> and down front? In 
The Manus Islands, where I work in New Guinea periodically, and I've been working for 47 years, when they start a speech now, they say, man, woman, children, pigs, dogs, and stones, <laughs> as an introductory remark. And as, of course, this series of lectures is patronized by the Audubon Society, I'm acutely aware they left out birds. <laughs> as as this is the last lecture in the series that have been given here, I have a few sacerdotal duties to perform. I want to thank Mr. Penalosa for having made this conference possible and reaffirm our general belief that the main thing was to get it here, that all the work that has been done in advance is going to leave a permanent mark on every country that participated in it. And now we're here. The next important thing is going to be the follow-up afterwards. And I also want to thank the memory of Dinos Doxiades, whose work started this whole push towards human settlements. And without him, it is quite likely that we would not have been here at all. And in the World Society for Acoustics, which was started by those who worked with him, we plan to continue, as we have in the past, this working on the whole problem of acoustics. Now, if anybody doesn't know what acoustics means, it is creeping into dictionaries. But it has not yet gotten into the OED. So if there are any representatives of the UK here, they might work on that fact. Uh, acoustics is the discipline of the study and practice of work in human settlements of all kinds. And you spell it E-K-I-S-T-I-C-S, -I -I as they tell you on the radio when they want you to order things. I have one further comment to make, and that is, that Iran has prepared a most beautiful volume called uh, Habitat, Bill of Rights. There were only a limited number brought to this meeting, but I think that people will want to be sure to look at it, because it is the best visual statement, I think, that's available to us in short order of the sort of things that we're talking about. Now, I think it would be best to begin with this question of human scale because I think there is nothing more tantalizing than listening to architects and planners talk about human scale. They, that's good. Now, what do I do? They all believe in it, and uh, they believe in it deeply. And, uh, this is inhuman scale. Now, right? That's not going to work. Because the definition that I want to give of human scale is things that are made, built, or constructed. <laughs> with human beings in mind. <laughs> because right after people have told you that something is everything should be of human scale, they tell you that the Parthenon is of human scale. And you know, if you look at it closely, it's rather large. <laughs> and yet they're quite right, of course. It is human scale because it dignifies and ennobles the people who stand within it. But there's a tendency for people to think that human scale means nothing should ever be tall or nothing should ever be large. And these are wide or deep. And these aren't really what we mean. You, uh, you can build a small skyscraper for older people that's really very human because they can go up and down in lifts instead of having to walk the distance from here to the door of this hotel, which, as I remember, was a walk that would be very hard on older people. It would have, I wish we'd had a lift as I came in. Uh, so that. When we talk about human scale, we primarily mean building that is built with human beings at the center of the thinking or the planning. And it makes an extraordinary difference. I remember going to a, a home for the 
for very older people in Australia. And the steps had been made, there were about six steps, and then there was a landing and a seat, and another six steps, and a landing and a seat, and another six steps, and a landing and a seat, and you felt the people who built that knew that older people get tired on steps. Now, one of our great problems in the world today is that building is being done by one set of people for another set of people, not for the people that are going to live there. The number of architect planners who plan a community in which they're going to live themselves, even in the community, is very small. And in a large proportion of the world today, the designing is done on one side of the world and exported for the cities of the other side of the world. And this is one of the things that is destroying us, because the way in which people live, the settlements in which they live as children and bringing up their children and looking at their grandchildren is the essential framework of human lives. Children learn within a community either to trust, to feel that it's safe to walk anywhere, and anywhere they'll find help and someone to kiss the place and make it well, or that they live in a community that, which they must view with suspicion and hatred and fear. They learn within the community whether, how to be responsible. Uh, one of the rules that I was taught as a small child was never to throw a banana peel on the street. That was supposed to sum up practically the whole of social responsibility in relation to garbage. <laughs> but it was very good. I've never forgotten it. I certainly would never throw a banana peel on the street. It litters the street, and somebody might slip on it. And these are the admonitions which are given to children and carried out by adults with whom they come in contact will make all the difference in the end. Now, there are hardly any communities that have been consciously built today that meet the requirements of community. Old communities, many old communities, small villages left in the mountains, sometimes meet the requirements physically. They very seldom now meet the requirements socially. Because if you find a small village that you can see was built with a place for everyone, a place for the old and a place for the young, a rather small house for the shiftless and a very large house for the industrious and things of this sort, you'll probably find that all the young people have gone away, for instance, or all the men have gone away and left a few women there alone. And almost nowhere on this planet today do we have the kind of community that we want for the future, the kind of community within which children as they grow up and adults as they change with the changing times will have a sense of all the things that need to be done on this planet. Now, we've been listening during these meetings to endless statistics. The growth of the population of the world, and it's frightening. The proportion of children under 15 in many of the countries with no one to care for them. The increasing longevity in the affluent countries and older people who are dispossessed, who have no opportunity to participate at all. If they're poor, they're stacked up in old people's homes like warehouses. And if they're rich, they're given the privilege of living in a golden ghetto or voting against everything they once believed in. And in none of these societies do we have the sort of thing that we would like to have. Now, as we plan for the world, plan to have the production of food better distributed and much more of it grown near home so that we don't use our energy, our quite precious stores of energy up moving food from one side of the continent to another or across oceans, as we plan for the production of energy close to home and of using more and more solar energy, which is replaceable and non-destructive, 
and phasing out nuclear energy and not depending upon it in the future. As we deal with all of these problems, and I must mention water, we're specializing in water at this meeting because it's an essential first element for health. As we think of all these things and, and have to present to people statistics of billions of people, millions of tons of grain, millions of dollars spent on this or that or lost here and there, human beings get lost in these statistics. And we need some way in which we can communicate to our children, to young people, to everyone, the way in which all of these great needs that we have to produce a planetary community are related to every small community that we produce. Now, if we produce a community that is just a collection of houses all the same size, designed somewhere else, with no reference to the people who live in them whatsoever, according to some set of regulations and plans that were drawn up by people who have no sense of what it's like to live there, where people live... <laughs>